Marvin, would you come? Love you, man. It's great seeing you. Love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, um, one of the, you know, I, I guess when I think back, I can remember when Fred called me and said, I'm leaving commission. Mm -hmm. And I said, who's going to take your place? And, uh, and then, uh, I get to meet a guy named Marvin Sapp. Yeah, it was Keith, though. Keith, oh, Keith, Keith left. Keith, yeah, Keith, Keith, Keith left. Yeah, right. yeah. Keith left. And, um, and so I get to meet a guy named Marvin who's got an incredible voice, but he's also got a phenomenal call on his life, and it just comes through regardless of whether he's singing or exhorting. Talk a little bit about that part of your journey. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because I, I remember while we're in the back talking, I begin to think about how we were in Memphis, Tennessee, right? and um, Fred had already left the group, and uh, there was a specific prophetic gift that was uh, prophesying to the group. He had the entire group to stand, and uh, this was my first real opportunity meeting you, and uh, you came and sat next to me, and, and you, you touched my arm, but then you sat back, and then you touched my arm again, and then, and then you just sat down and sat back, and then all of a sudden you touched my arm, and you pulled me down, and you said, that's not the word of the Lord for you. That's the word of the Lord for them. And you begin to prophesy into my life and begin to share with me the things that God was going to bring about in my life, the transitions that I was going to experience uh, leaving commission and going into solo uh, career as far as uh, recording and, and preaching across this entire world. And, uh, I mean, it's just it's mind-blowing. I want to say thank you um, for being receptive to the Holy Spirit that night, uh, because your night to minister was the next night. Um, but I'm thankful that you have the word of the Lord for me for that evening. So I just wanted to say that first. Um, I'm blown away. I'm, I'm blown away by, by what God has done and what God is doing in my life. Um, I was a young boy. I was 22 years of age when, when all this started to happen. And uh, my mom taught me a song many years ago. And one verse of that song, actually one line of it, sticks out so very clearly how it says that life is filled with swift transition. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the time that I should be enjoying the success of selling millions of records and things of that nature, you know, life for me has been extremely bittersweet. Uh, in the last five years, I've lost four of the most important people in my life. Mm -hmm. um, from my natural father to my spiritual father, to my musical mentor, and uh, recently, over the last 10 months, the love of my life, a woman I met in the third grade on the playground, and uh, the mother of my three children. And, uh, you know, I think what people fail to realize is it's easy for us as pastors, preachers, teachers, to get up and preach about how to go through situations when you're not going through them. But it's a whole nother story when you find yourself in the middle of the situation and the people around you are looking at you, wondering if you're going to be the example that you've been preaching and teaching and singing about. And uh, it, it, can be, it can be challenging. Um, but I'll tell anybody that in this season of my life, I can't understand how people make it through these types of situations without God. Um, because I stand here to tell you that he will absolutely unequivocally without question keep you in perfect peace mm. if you keep your mind stayed on him. Mother, um, let's, let's start with dad because I remember when, when, when dad passed. Yeah. At that point, what, what, what was it for you that you felt like in losing him? What, what part of you did you feel like you had to let go of what what was that about you know honestly when, when, when my father and my and my pastor uh, when they when, when they bishop both passed abney. when bishop abney and, right. and my natural father passed you know there are people that you have in your life that you trust to be able to share things about you that you can't share with everybody so i felt like the individuals that i trusted with my secrets and the things that i wanted to be transparent about with them um, it w they were gone. And um, it took years to develop that type of relationship. Of course, with my natural father, it was fairly easy. But with 
with my spiritual father, it took years to develop that type of relationship where I can go to him and be transparent about, about my issues, about my struggles, about my triumphs, about my trials. And, uh, you know, I miss that. Mm. Uh, I miss that. But, but I also understand that it was also a part of teaching and training me to be that type of individual to the sons and daughters that God is going to bring my way. Um, so, you know, even though I don't have that, uh, that type of father-son relationship uh, that I used to have, I understand what it's like, and I understand what I'm supposed to do, and I understand my assignment. So as they were talking about the whole process of shifting, you know, you know all of my mentors and stuff, they're going home to be with the Lord. The people that I, I preached for for years, you know, they're transitioning. And uh, I, I sense the shift now. Uh, the things that I ran away from as far as, you know, uh, being a mentor to other individuals. You know, I'm, I'm considered to be uh, a legend now. Mm -hmm. uh, my God, I'm 44 years old, <laughs> and uh, I've been in this industry for 20 years, plus years, and now I'm a legend, you know. And uh, so now I'm finding that, you know, there are individuals that are having struggles that need uh, to be encouraged, uplifted, challenged, chastened, and uh, I'm finding that that's my responsibility now. So um, I'm loving it. Um, I'm embracing it. Um, not fearful of it. But, but I know that if God has placed me in this position, it must be because he trusts me. Well, I can, you know, one thing for me, you know, that I can say about you is that you have always acted in relationship with senior leaders mm -hmm. in, a, in, an, in the utmost honor and integrity. Bishop Abney loved you, yeah. uh, you know, and, but sometimes dads have a hard time letting go of sons. <laughs> yeah. And there does come a point, <laughs> and I mean, before he passed, he was, he was with us, and, yeah. and I had him get up and sing, I won't complain, and he wrecked the house. But I mean, <laughs> he loved you, he loved you like his own. Um, and yet, Bishop, as much as he loved you, needed to realize, needed to let you go so you could do what God called you to do. Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was challenging. It, it was definitely challenging, um, you know, because when you have a son and you love that son and you want them to do things a certain type of way, it, sometimes it can be difficult for you to release them to be their own man and to uh, release them to go dig their own wells. And, um, but you it, had to do it. I had to. I, I had to do it because um, the only thing I wanted from my pastor uh, was his blessing. I, I didn't want any money. I didn't want uh, anything other than to be there to, to catch the mantle because he was a singer, songwriter, oh, preacher, teacher, businessman. I mean, he was just, he was, he was multifaceted. And uh, I, I, I looked at him and I said, that is what I ascribe to be. He was a family man. He was a loving father. Um, you know, he was committed to his wife. And those are all the things that, that impressed me about Bishop Abney. And, um, you know, so when I left, I, I took those things with me. I took those, those integral aspects of who he was. And, uh, you know, even though initially it was kind of rough, um, before he went on to be with the Lord, came to my church, mm -hmm. laid hands mm -hmm. on me, washed my feet before my whole mm -hmm. entire church, uh, loved on me, and uh, I loved on him, and 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 without question, uh, one of the greatest fathers in ministry. Because you know, sometimes when you get to be a certain age, you know it's kind of difficult for you to learn new tricks. You can't teach an old dog new tricks for you know. But but he he was he was man enough, and I never forget. He came to my office, and he said to me, he said, um, I've been in a teaching at the church. Uh, about following peace with all men, no, without, you know, follow peace with all men, holiness without, no man can see the Lord. And he said, I've been in this teaching, and, and, and God spoke to me while I was in prayer, and he said to me, he said, how in the world can you be teaching on following peace when you don't even have peace with your own son? Mm. And he cried, and he shed tears, and, and I cried with him, and my wife was there, and she cried with him, and we all just were just bawling like some, mm. it was just, it was ugly. Oh, my God. I mean, that, not, that, not that, you know, cute cry where you, you know, grab it like this, but just snotting it uh, all over the floor. And uh, that, that day, that day changed the rest of our lives. And, uh, 
uh, one of the greatest men to ever walk the face of the earth was Bishop William C. Adney. I agree. I yeah. agree. And then, and then Marvin, when Melinda began to face her trial, I, I know this is, you haven't talked about this, no. um, but if you'd be willing, because a lot of people have, you know, one of the things that I think is we don't do well mm -hmm. in, in, in church is we, we don't grieve well because we've been, we've been taught to mask stuff. Absolutely. Um, Melinda was indeed the love of your life. You have three beautiful children. Talk about as things began to become evident, how did you guys process that together? And then let's move forward then from there to where you are now. Well, you know, what, what, what happened was is, is, you know, we had a lot of ups and downs. I, I was flying my wife back and forth to Houston, Texas, to MD Anderson, uh, the, the top cancer clinic right. in, in, in the entire world. And I, I thank God for all of the staff members that worked so very wonderfully down there with us. And uh, it, what happened was is that the cancer infiltrated her spinal cord. Um, it only happens in 1% of cancer patients. And when it infiltrated, I think, the fluids in her spinal cord, it immediately just began to attack all of her bodily functions, and, and it begins to shut down. She just wound down like a clock. And um, when the doctors told us that, um, you know, I, first off, I don't believe in, in secrets. My kids, we were very, very transparent through the whole process. Um, my wife was a clinician by profession. She uh, possessed uh, two bachelor's degrees in psychology, psychology and sociology, uh, two masters in psych and social, and a doctorate in biblical counseling. And, uh, you know, so, of course, uh, she, she shared with us different things and, that we needed to do in order to prepare our kids and, and to get them ready for you know, this transition of life. And one of the key things was to be open and honest with them in every phase, from diagnosis to, you know, when they told us that there was nothing else that they could do. Um, one of the most difficult things in my life was when I had to take my kids away and share with them um, that the doctor said that there was nothing more that they can do, but we were going to remain in faith and remain in prayer. Because kids are... They're resilient, of course, but this is their mother. And then this is my wife. This is the woman that I partnered with to do everything with. I mean, from, from managing my career to being the administrative pastor of my church to negotiating contracts with record companies to negotiating uh, financial deals with real estate to cooking and cleaning and washing and and taking care of me and managing every aspect of my life. All I had to do literally was get up, pack my bag, go preach, sing, come back home, deposit checks into the account, and that was my life for 18 years. And uh, to lose uh, someone who took care of everything. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is I, I can be honest and transparent enough to say, uh, I, I went to God, I said, God, you gotta make this make sense. I said. I don't, it's not that I don't know how to do it. It's just that I've never had to do it. And, and now I got to be father. I got to do homework. I got to go to uh, parent-teacher conferences. I'm the evangelist. That's my assignment. I'm the international recording artist. That's my assignment. Now I got to go to plays. I got to figure out how to do hair. Oh, my God. You know, all of these different things... I just began to bombard me immediately. And immediately, I can be honest with you, fear crept in. And I was driving down the road one day after she had passed, and I, I was crying, and, and uh, I've never shared this, but, but, but I, I told God, I said, I can't, I can't do this. I'm, I'm resigning from the church. Uh, I, I gotta figure something else out. I can't handle all of this stuff. God, why would you take my wife away from me, and why would you, why would you put me in a position where I gotta do this all by myself and I pulled over and I broke down in tears and God spoke to me so clearly he said Marvin you've, you've never done this by yourself he said before it was three of us now it's two of us he said if I brought you and Melinda to this level what makes you think that I'm going to leave you out here by yourself I'm going to bring you through this and I dried my tears and I pulled myself together and I drove to the church and uh, things, things have been great at the church. My kids, they're doing extremely well. Matter of fact, my daughter wrote a book 
And uh, for people who want to get it, they can go to my website. It's an e-book because during the time when my wife was going through uh, her chemotherapy, my daughter, my middle child, who was her best friend, began to act out. And my, daughter, my wife said, listen, journal, journal, journal. She began to journal, and we began to read her journal, and it became a book. My daughter's 13, 14 years old, and she wrote a book called uh, The Girl Behind the Mask, The Diary of Marvin Sapp's Daughter. And it has been so very therapeutic for her. She has sold thousands of these books. Um, our public school system has used them. Um, and after school programs and all types of things. Her name is Michaela Sapp. You can go online, marvinsapp.com. You can download the ebook. I wrote books during this period of time um, that people can go on our website and get. And I mean, it's, 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 it's a difficult time. Um, every day is different. Uh, I cry daily. I'm not going to make like I don't. Um, we go to a counselor. Uh, because that's something that we don't talk about in the church. You know, we think that, you know, when you're mourning and stuff that you're just supposed to pray through. No, you need somebody to talk to. Exactly. You need to get in counseling about this. And um, my kids are in counseling. I'm in counseling. And uh, I'm just believing that, you know, there has to be a purpose for this. Uh, and I don't understand it right now. But again, the old songwriter said it best. We will understand it better by and by. In a moment, I'm going to have you pray for families that are grieving. Dr. Melinda was a brilliant woman. Extremely. Um, have you archived her materials? Absolutely. Because I think that would be a tremendous gift. Talk a little bit about, because, I mean, your wife, your wife shared a whole, lot of people uh, know. a whole lot in that house. I mean, you're yeah. a brilliant preacher. But having been around your wife once or twice, mm -hmm. she, is, she is a brilliant woman. My wife was on the board of the mental hospital in our city of foundation. She um, was a college professor, a uh, phenomenal teacher and preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, but she was very domestic, and I think that's what made her so powerful. Um, she, we had a nice-sized house, but she never wanted a maid. I'm getting one. I don't care. I'm just, I, you know, she, she, never, she never wanted a maid. She never wanted a cook. I'm getting a cook, too, because... I asked my kids about, uh, about three weeks ago, I said, how's dad doing? Give me a grade. You know, my babies was like, you know, my girls was like, dad, you're doing phenomenal. Girls, they were like, you're doing great. My son said, dad, you're doing great, but I think you need to watch the Food Network. I really do. <laughs> uh, so, so we're working at that. But, but Melinda was, was, was a phenomenal gift, an unbelievable teacher, preacher of the gospel, um, a philanthropist. Even now, uh, we're in a uh, capital campaign for $5 million in uh, for one of her babies, and that was the Grand Rapids Ellington Academy of Arts and Technology, um, better known as Great Schools, Inc. It was a, a charter school that my wife had uh, put together, and uh, things are happening very fast for us. Um, we're about to build a 32,000-square-foot facility on our campus at Kingdom Square um, to start our charter school in the fall of 2012. This was her baby. This was her brainchild, and uh, we're keeping it moving. That was her slogan. She said, keep it moving. She would say it all the time, keep it moving, people, keep it moving. <laughs> and that's what she would say all the time. So our theme for the year has been keep it moving. And uh, the Grampus Ellington Academy of Arts and Technology is so very wonderful because it's going to be the first, I believe, the first performing arts uh, school in West Michigan. And, and I'm really excited about that simply because... <laughs> One of the things that has happened in our public school system is uh, the reason why our kids, I believe, they struggle is because of the removal of the arts. Um, when you begin to do a research, you would find that children that have the arts implemented in core curriculums, that they test five times, five times higher than those who do not have them. Because it stimulates the right it hemisphere of the brain. Absolutely. So, so my wife and I, growing up in public school, having the arts, in our public school system decided that that was something that we wanted to do and we've been working on it for a season and um, she went on to be with the Lord but just because she's not physically here does not mean that her vision has to die yeah. so we're excited about that and uh, moving her vision forward and uh, for those who may be interested all they got to do is go to the website go to greatschoolsinc.com or greatschoolsagreat.com uh, and they can get information about our school and They can do that as well. Since I'm talking about it, I might as well talk about it. So, um, but I mean, she, she, she had a lot of dreams, a lot of passions, and just 
uh, doing a lot of great, great things, and I miss her dearly. I mean, I miss her like crazy because that was my best friend. I can be honest with you. I mean, you know, it's one thing to be married, um, but it's another thing to be married and excited about coming home. And, uh, you know, I used to tell people all the time one of my greatest testimonies was uh, I never had a revival to hold over uh, because I always wanted to come home. I was on the plane. I was renting private jets. I was getting to the house uh, because I had a great relationship with my wife. You know, not just, you know, sexual, but just conversation. It, it, was, it, was, it was stimulating. It was, it was motivating. And even when I felt down, uh, she had a way of encouraging me. Mm-hmm. And then, most importantly, when I began to rise and get the big head about stuff. She had a way of bringing me down. Funny story, and I, and I know I got to pray for the people, but um, I had won a BET award. Man, it was the biggest day of my life. We had caught a red eye home and uh, got to the house, and I was like, baby, can't you believe? Oh, my God, I'm a BET award winner. Oh, my goodness, da 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 I'm like, so excited. And she was grabbing stuff out the car because we had just got home, and I kept talking about it, and she said, yeah, yeah, I think that's awesome, sweetie. Um, there's some garbage I need you to take <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> and I grabbed the garbage and I put it in the garbage bin and I rolled it out to the front of the driveway and I said, well, I guess this BET moment is over. <laughs> you know? She had a wonderful way of keeping me grounded and uh, those thoughts of her and, and, and just thinking about who she was and, and all the things that she still is in my life, it's, it's just awesome. Take about 60 seconds and pray for the people that are grieving. Father God, I thank you even now, Lord God, because you've declared in your word that in everything that we're supposed to give you thanks. And it's in these times, Lord God, it's in these moments where it's extremely difficult to tell you thank you when when you've lost someone that's important to you, someone that you felt that you needed in order to thrive and survive. But Lord God, you also let us know, Lord God, that you would be our all in our all, everything that we need in every situation. You've declared and you've shared with us that you would never leave us, nor would you forsake us, but you would be with us always, always. And I thank you, Lord God, for that comforting thought. I thank you for that comforting word. Now, God, bless them and make them a blessing. Keep them encouraged. Strengthen them even now. Give them to know, Lord God, that you're there with them in every situation, in every circumstance. I thank you, and I give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate you, man. Love you much. I'm a little hoarse today, man. Y'all excuse them bad notes. I hear a lot of bad notes tonight. Please excuse me. If if you're bad, then I'd hate to see what great is. (laughs) And and speaking of that, there is, we're waiting for the new project. Working on it now. Going to record in uh, the month of October, October the 7th in Washington, D.C. Excited about it. And, uh... You know, I'm just, I'm believing God. This friend of mine says this all the time, and it's become my slogan. I'm believing God that even through this transition that I'm facing, that the rest of my days are going to be the best of my days. And we're going to believe with you. Thank Marvin, you. we love you. Thank you. Deeply appreciate you. Tonight has been one of those signature nights when the flow of the Holy Spirit has been moving from the beginning right through to touch your needs, your hearts, right where you are. Whether you are in a season of shifting, whether you are in a season where you're having to learn how to be transparent, whether you're in a season where you're discovering, I can't keep this to myself, I've got to share the gospel with others, and whether or not you're in a season where you've lost the most precious things in life you've ever known, Jesus is there with you in all of it and what we desperately need today is a Jesus without additives or preservatives we need a recovery of the testimony of Jesus in the earth and that begins with you until next time on behalf of Dr. Paul and Jan this is Dr. Mark Sharona reminding you keep praising the Lord 